Well, we have some challenges, don't we? And for so many of you that were here last night for Dr. Lindsay's presentation, you would see that we are really being put through the spiral of the dialectic. And that's how human history is continuing now. The thing is this, is that opposed to, let's say, from a, almost like a post-millennial context, to where things were getting better as we discovered new things, and especially what happened during the period of where human knowledge became something that was unrestricted, where all of a sudden we trusted human knowledge and flourishing and intelligence and research within the common man. That's when things really began to take off. See, but there's a thing that happens with human beings. And that thing that happens with human beings is institutions. And it's in your institutions that you must trust, correct? And you would think you, you become, well, I'm a person of this institution, or I'm a follower of this particular teacher, or I'm someone who, in regards to where I receive my education, my seminary education, whatever it may be. Well, I'm a man that was trained by this institution. Well, the thing that happens is that all of a sudden, those institutions, if something happens that begins to corrupt them from within, within, that's where you really start to have some problems. But today, what we can say assuredly is that we are living in the death, the death of the pursuit of objective truth. So regardless of whatever your situation is, we as, as a total civilization, as, as a society, are living under the death of the pursuit of objective truth. Remember that George Orwell stated the following, he said, quote, the further a society drifts from truth, the more it will hate those who speak it. And that's what happens. So how dare you speak the truth? Because whether we admit it or not, we are the agents of our epoch of time. What also must be understood, really, as we go back to Ecclesiastes, is that there's nothing new under the sun. Because we live in an age, we live in an age where our personal volition, our freedom of conscience, our ability to reason, our pursuit of knowledge, our right to worship or not, as we individually see fit, our cognitive liberties are to a fault really taken for granted. And you know, I first spoke these words in a message back in 2019. Not many understood at that time what challenges we were about ready to face. So as many of you know, in the course of human history, and specifically in the history of Western civilization, this theme has time and time again been repeated by those who claim to want to usher in the new utopia, as Dr. Lindsay was referring to last night. But in fact, they always bring in, when they're talking of the new utopia, they always have a tendency to want to bring in the new fascistic totalitarianism. So how did we arrive at this place? How did we get here? How did we get to this moment in time that we find ourselves in, in 2022? Well, let's put our thinking caps on, have a little bit of an imagination. How many of you here have been to Wittenberg, Germany? The site of the Reformation. Good, a few of you. You need to come with me sometime. We've been leading tours there for years and years and years. If we can still go without having magical medical juice being injected into our veins. <laughs> but if you turn back the clock 500 years and start thinking about the Sitzenleben, which would be the situation in life 500 years ago, Maybe you woke up this morning like I did, and the main issue that I had was, ah, this Wi-Fi stinks, you know? <laughs> or, you know, it's taking an awful long time for the hot water to really kick into the pipes here, you know? Or, oh my goodness, they ran out of dark coffee Ugh. at the hotel. You know, I wish they didn't have fruit that was just all mush, you know? 
at the, at the hotel. So these are first world problems. These are problems that we have in the 21st century. Imagine 500 years ago what your problems were. Before, we had the opportunity when it is, I think tomorrow the high is going to be 117 degrees here. And many of you were saying, but Mike, it's a little cold in here. It's like, bring a sweater. You know? <laughs> I don't think we're going to take the temperature down as our, uh, our meeting space here had become quite full yesterday, didn't it? And so the temperature started to rise. Let's not even mess with that when we're talking about 117 degrees. But 500 years ago, let's move back our way of thinking, what was different then? Yesterday, we were looking at how things were five years ago or five years in the future. What was it 500 years ago for people that were trying to live their lives and make sense of things? In a world that really wasn't changing, by the way. The world didn't change. It didn't get outside of the realm or the control of the experts. Those that had the answers. That made the rules that you needed to follow. Well, the proclamation of those that enjoyed the radical concept of what is known as the Protestant Reformation was this, post tenebras lux, after darkness, light. We lived in a period, a tunnel of darkness. And not that there weren't advances, but many of those advances, of course, happened within the realm of whom? The experts. And you were to be told, what to do, how to do it, what to think, what to pray, who to worship, how to worship, when to worship. You were told if you could read, what books you could read, and what language you needed to read, what languages you weren't allowed to read. So after the centuries of the monarchial episcopate, when I say monarchial episcopate, I'm saying monarchy in terms of ruler, and episcopate in terms of the church, the monarchical episcopate, the state church. So after centuries of the monarchical episcopate, ensuring that their subjects live in ignorance, they'll be told what they need to know. So you're on a need to know basis. You're on a need to worship basis. You're on a need to think basis. And under their subjective understanding of revealed truth. The light of truth in the Reformation broke through the darkness into the vernacular language of the cultures and tribes and cantons of the day, of the common people. And the great age of knowledge then began. And I really want you to think about how this affected the transmission of knowledge in the 16th century. We're talking the 1500s here. The, trans the transmission of scripture. Let's go back 1300 years before that. You know, I don't just lead tours in Germany. We lead tours as well in Switzerland, in Ireland, and other places like that. And in Ireland, one of the places that you would think, well, why would we go to Ireland? You know, what the heck do we have to see there if it has anything to do with Christian history? Well, we developed a tour there. And now others are beginning to replicate it, just like everything else that everybody does that we start. <laughs> they replicate it. What we did is I focused on the transmission of Scripture. Now, what the heck does that have to do with Ireland? Well, first of all, you had the Chester Beatty Museum. And in the Chester Beatty Museum, what you have was, and what you do have, is P45, one of the earliest extant manuscripts of the New Testament. I, literally, probably one of the five or six earliest existing. It's not as old as the Rylands fragment, of course, P52. But you as well, you had P66 when I brought a group through there. 
And so what you can do is you can see this is how people transmitted Scripture. And do you know how they did it? They did it on folded papyrus leaves and then tried to etch it on with whatever means they had. Or they did it on the back of animal skins. And part of the problem that you had in the transmission of Scripture is, let's say that that animal had a bad day one day and and woke, you know, he walked up against a rose bush or something else that had, you know, a thorn on it and scratch. Well, then you're looking at the manuscript later if it's on if it's on leather, on vellum, and you're trying to say, well, did that guy just have a bad day, or is that actually something else in Greek? I can't tell. So that affects sometimes the transmission of scripture. I, I think David Farnell's in here someplace, right? Yeah, please just bear with me on this, please, David. But but what you would have is you'd have people that were under persecution. They were under persecution at the time by the church for doing what? For sharing the testimony of the apostles, the apostolic tradition. And so instead, what the monarchical episcopate of the day wanted is they wanted to make sure that that was constrained. So each time that you copied the Gospels or the letters of Paul, basically you were putting a death sentence on your head. We don't live in that time anymore, do we? How many Bibles do you have in your house? Do you have a King James, a new King James, an NASB, an Amplified? Do you have the message that you're kindly you know, grandmother gave to you several years ago, you know, saying, oh, here's the Bible. It's like, that's not the Bible. Thank you very much. But it's like a fictionalized version of it, right? You, you have brown Bibles and red Bibles and white Bibles and Bibles with all sorts of fancy lettering and big letters and small letters and ones that have all sorts of pretty pictures in them. You probably have Bibles on your smartphones. You have Bibles on your laptops. You have them in all sorts of different languages. You have all sorts of different concordances. You have more of what is known as the Word of God than any generation in the history of mankind. As a matter of fact, not just that, you have more knowledge at your fingertips than any generation in the history of mankind. But we don't think about that for a moment, do we? So, in Ireland, I would take people through this tour of the Chester Beatty Museum and see the, the old manuscripts that are there. It's amazing, it really is. And a lot of people don't even care that it's there. Most of them want to go across the street, and this is important, too, to go see the Book of Kells, which is very, very, very pretty, you know, that was made centuries later. But here's the difference. The ones that are P45 and P66 and the others and so forth were made during a period of persecution. And when you had to hurry sometimes because you wanted to make sure that the new congregation of faith 40 miles up the road had an opportunity to have this. And we need to spirit it away. So copies were made and copies were made and copies were made and copies were made and distributed all over the place. And there wasn't one index that was, well, this is the one thing, and this is how we know it's true, is because we have this in Alexandria, or we have this in Jerusalem, or we have this in Rome. No, really the way that God preserved his word was by scattering it throughout. At that time, what was known as the Roman Empire, and even beyond, because people were desperate to get other people the truth, because the truth will set you free. So they sacrificed their lives, and imperfect people that were trying to scratch along without chapters, without paragraphs, without this being verse 4 or verse 5, no, they just did it. And they did it on the back of animal skins, and they did it on folded papyrus and pressed leaves and so forth. 
And they sent it everywhere. Because their life and their time was less important to them than what they considered to be the truth. But then something changed. And after years of persecution, centuries of persecution, the Diocletian perse persecution, we can say, was horrible. Where Christians were blamed for everything that happened that didn't go well in the Roman Empire, right? It was the Christians' fault. Well, God used, again, imperfect people to all of a sudden make it not just something that was legal to practice Christianity, but it was actually endorsed. It was now the religion of the state, the state religion. A monarchical episcopate, which is good for time because, I mean, think about it. If you've been under persecution and if you're having the faith transmitted from person to person in your family from generation to generation and all you see sometimes is uncle so-and-so gets thrown to the lions or killed or crucified or burned or whatever the case may be. If you're thinking, oh, that time's over. But there's a catch because now the state's going, well, look, we have a massive empire here, okay? And we've got people all over the place in this empire that have different things that they worship. They have different gods. They have different paths to truth or to knowledge. They have a different way of conceiving God. So we kind of need to syncretize the way that we do things. But at the same time, we have to make sure that if we send somebody now for the state religion to, let's say, to those savages in Ireland, you know, those people that you know, used to eat each other and dance around rocks and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> they were wild people. You know, if we go there, how do we know that the church in Ireland is saying the right thing? Because they're speaking some strange languages out there. Languages that we don't even know what the heck they're saying. Well, what we need is a standard. So we need a standard language. Like, let's say that it's Latin that we make it, because that is the, the language of the state. And now we know if we go and we listen to a sermon or if we go and listen to them performing the mass, if we hear them going through the rituals that we prescribe that are the true rituals that are doctrinally sound and so forth, we need to know that they're true, that they're right, that things are correct. Well, the people won't understand those things and we can't expect them to anyway. Most of them are kind of, I don't know, deplorable anyway. <laughs> so what we wanna do is just make sure that they follow the rules. They need to listen to the experts. And we will begin to transmit scripture again. So we go from this period of the minority manuscripts to the majority manuscripts. And there is a period of time there you have, of course, Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and others that are actually being made that are tremendous. You can go to the British Library and see some of these things. But you go from a period now all of a sudden where we're going to start transitioning, at least within one particular flow of faith, into more Latin manuscripts. And Latin manuscripts are what is delivered then to the church. The church in Ireland, or the church in, in Germania, the church in Gaul, which would be known as France, where you have a man by the name of Irenaeus, years before the state church, who would fight against the heresies of the Gnostics. And that was actually before everything became Latinized. But here in Ireland, then, all of a sudden, then, around 400 to 500 AD, they have these things that are called the Psalters, and most of them are in Latin, and they are read before the congregations and so forth. There was a, a person in northwestern Ireland, I don't want to go into all the details and so forth, who created, in at least this is the apocryphal legend, but a lot of it is true, so we had to try to make our way to find out really what happened. So he wrote and composed a beautiful Psalter, used calligraphy and so forth. 
and he brought it over to another priest named Com Keel in northwestern Ireland. And he said, look at what I've done. Is this not beautiful? I mean, this brings inspiration into your heart. And Com Keel looks at it and says, oh, yeah, that is beautiful. May I keep it for a night or two? Sure, absolutely. So he keeps it, and Com Keel, who was quite a calligraphist, did an even better job and copied it. So then he goes back to the original person that had made this and says, hey, look what I've done. And the person that made the original manuscript says, well, that's a very nice Psalter. Matter of fact, it's a little bit better than even what I did, but that's just like mine, so I'd say that it is mine. You copied what I did. So they end up going before the king, and the king makes a, a ruling. He says, to every cow, it's calf, and to every book, it's copy. It's one of the first recorded instances regarding plagiarism. This is in Ireland. Well, Com Keel didn't like that. And long story short, short, they ended up having a battle at the base of the mountain called Ben Bulben. This is just south of Donegal, just north of Sligo. And according to the record, about 3,000 men were killed over the Psalter. Yep. Because what they did is they got their men together and said, this is wrong. This is this. So now all of a sudden think about this. Within four to five centuries, you go from, I'm going to risk my life to copy this and to send it everywhere, to, oh yeah? Well, you think that's good? Really? Well, I did it better. And then one second, well, yeah, maybe you did, but that looks just like mine, so it's mine. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm going to get my men, and we're going to fight you over this. And we're going to kill thousands of people over this. The king got word of this whole fight and this battle. So what he did is he told Com Keel, you're out of here. No longer will you be in Ireland. And cast him out. If that was the end of the story, it would be wonderful. So he got his, well, he repented of this. He still had a chip on his shoulder, though, because men are imperfect. It's the way that men are, right? But this guy, Calm Keel, he ends up going to Scotland, cast out of Ireland. He converts the tribes of northern Scotland, the Picts, to Christianity. And he was so well revered in northern Scotland, all of these apocryphal legends start to be created around him about Com Keel and the dragon that is in the water, which became the legend of the Loch Ness Monster. And as well, what he does is he then forms a monastery where they start to do Scribner work and do transmission of scripture. Of course, even more beautiful than what they originally fought over in Ireland which eventually becomes the illuminated manuscript tradition, which eventually becomes the Book of Kells. But think about this, how you went from a period of the truth must be preserved at all cost to all of a sudden where the truth is flourishing and it's everywhere, and now it's a part of what happens with the state, to now you take the truth for granted, and I'm doing it better than you, and we form new tribes, and we kill each other over it. It's kind of what we call commonly today as siloing. Because when something is legal, you take it for granted. When truth comes with a cost, you do whatever is necessary to preserve that truth. And there will be those that will come against you. So that's why Ireland is important. But let's fast forward again. 500, well, now we'll go forward a thousand years now. Think about that. So between that and what happened with the Reformation, a lot of things happen. So... The scriptures were in Latin. The mass was set in Latin to make sure that they protected the doctrines of the church that was decided were the doctrines of the church from Rome. So it became the language of the church. 
But one of the first reasons, of course, was the ability to control, to measure truth, and to ensure that the doctrine of the church remained the doctrine of the church. In the farthest reaches of the Roman Catholic Church, and I mean, if you really think about this, of the far reaches of how far the Roman Catholic Church actually would reach, and then, of course, you'd have the Orthodox Church and the Coptic Church as well, and the, Byz the Byzantine Church, how far they would reach. Well, if you had a bishop or someone wanting to make sure that your priests in Ireland were saying the right thing, right and right thing, well, you had to make sure it was under control. Now, this had consequences, though, because the people did not speak Latin. Most of them didn't. Most of them were uneducated. You had an educated class that did, but most didn't even know what was being said. They couldn't read the language, and they couldn't read the language that was the source of their authority, the Bible. And they were told that they had to trust the, the source of the rest of the authority, the church, so two pillars of authority. So you, the average person, didn't have the ability to see and read for yourself, to see if what their local priest or bishop was saying conform to the source of the authority of the Bible. They just had to trust what their priest told them was true. But several things began to change. It began to change all of that in the centuries to come. Number one, you had a change to papal authority. And the I'm sorry, you had a challenge to the papal authority. And the challenge to the papal authority didn't necessarily come from the outside. It came from the inside. Because all of a sudden, you had a pope that decided that he wanted to stay in Avignon, France. I really don't want to go to Rome. I love it here. You know? And I really like it here in Lyon as well. It's very pretty here. Rome, oh, man, it's crowded. There's a lot going on there. The smells there are not like the smells in the south of France and Provence. And for a time, in what is called the Babylonian captivity of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church, you had two competing popes, which eventually became three, but you had two competing popes. Now, if you were a faithful member of the Catholic Church at that time, who'd been told for centuries, and your families were told for centuries, no, you can't trust what's being said here in these scriptures that are in Latin. You can't trust yourself. You need to go to the authority to understand these things because they know better. They're the experts, you see. You have to trust the experts. You yourself can't be trusted with that truth. So all of a sudden, if you're a faithful member of your church in Southeast France, or within the cantons, which eventually be known as Switzerland, or in Germany, or in Prague, maybe you would start to question saying, huh, so you're saying that you are still the, the authority in faith and practice in Rome, but yet so is this other guy. He's saying that he's the authority. So how about it if you just allow us access to the other pillar of authority, the scriptures, and we'll make up our own mind. How about that? So there was a crisis of authority. And you had men who rose up, Jan Hus in Prague. And 100 years later, Martin Luther in Germany. 100 years later, you know what? There's a funny story that goes along with that. And I'm sure most of this is apocryphal, maybe not. And as somebody that has been leading tours for decades now in all these lands, in Israel, in Germany, in Switzerland, in, in England, where you had men like Latimer and Ridley that were burned outside the Buttermore Library in, in Oxford, who said, play the man. For this day, we will surely light a fire. That were willing to give their lives for the pursuit of what they knew was truth, what they believed was truth. And to go to these areas in Germany and Switzerland and other people where people took a stand. Well, you think about this for a second. What happened is, 
With Jan Hus in Prague, and we've led tours to Prague as well, he took a stand, and eventually that stand that he took, saying Rome was wrong, led to him being burned in Constance and his ashes being thrown in the Rhine. That's the price that he had. And the man in the church that condemned him to that death basically said, this is in the apocryphal legend, you know, when Jan Hus had stood before the throne and said, a hundred years from now, a swan will rise that you will never be able to silence. This is a hundred years before Luther. And apparently the authority had said, over my dead body. That's not going to happen. Well, do you know where that man is that condemned, and this is true, that condemned Jan Hus to death? He's buried in Erfurt in the Catholic Church underneath the, underneath the, the altar that was what was the seminary there, where a hundred years later, a young priest named Martin Luther served his first Mass. I don't know how much of that is true, but I, the figures are true, and where they're buried is true, and that all happened. Luther performed his first Mass, trembling, trying not to spill the, em the, the elements over the man that had condemned Jan Hus to death. So, something else providentially had captured at that same time that Luther had courage in the early 1500s and mid-1500s to take his stand. And that was the printing press. So providentially, these things are happening at the same time. So information distribution is wide, all of a sudden for the first time. So all of a sudden, knowledge was accessible. And so a Roman Catholic priest named Martin Luther could read the Latin of the church. But here's the great thing about this, guys. And we would say that possibly Martin Luther either had Asperger's or something. The guy was brilliant. Well, he could read the Greek of the original autographs as well, so not just the Latin. And Martin Luther, the young Catholic priest, saw that some, well, let's say, misinformation in the Latin manuscripts in comparison to the Greek. It's like something isn't quite what it says there. So he began to speak up loudly. And so Martin Luther was eventually brought forth before the council at Worms in Worms, Germany. And I've stood on that spot in Worms. You know, it's almost cartoonish now. You, they have these now these pair of brass or pewter shoes that look almost Disney cartoonish, like what Goofy would have worn in the cartoons, where you can put your feet in where Martin Luther took his stand. This is where Luther stood and said, here I stand. They're almost mocking it. And what really occurred at that spot? Well, Martin Luther claimed in his arguments against what Rome was saying was purely through the authority of Scripture and not through them. And what he's saying is that there's a crisis right now in terms of authority. Now, the spokesperson for the Holy Roman Emperor, Johann Eck, stated to Luther, he said this, quote, Martin there is no heresy which has torn the bosom of the church, which has not derived its origin from the various interpretations of the scripture. The Bible itself is the arsenal whence each innovator has drawn his deceptive arguments. It was with biblical texts that Pelagius and Arius maintained their doctrines, Luther. So the spokesperson for the emperor at the Council of Worms, when talking to Luther, blames what is the problem? The scriptures. The final authority in faith and practice. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, why are you spending all this time talking to the church when you should be talking about the things? There's some of you here that are not within the community of faith. I need you to think about what's happening here. The same pattern is being followed. Well, we can't have you distribute misinformation and disinformation. We need to control the way that authority comes through. And all of a sudden, 
goofy millennials that started social media companies are the ones controlling the <laughs> distribution of truth. Somebody that's never put on a day in a, a tie in their day in their lives, except when they were sitting before Congress like an android, <laughs> are controlling the flow of truth. And they're saying to you, don't you understand that you, the community that goes through the scientific method, you yourself are the arsenal whence each innovator has drawn their deceptive arguments. See, there's nothing that we have today that is more problematic than what actually comes from the people who are pursuing the truth. No, you need to trust the experts. So again, back 500 years ago, Rome tried to counter Luther saying, you can't be trusted with the truth on your own. You need to trust the experts. Now, how did Luther respond to this? And I want you of you that are, those of you that are here that are not part of the community of faith to listen. Because Luther provides the example. He provides the pattern for which we are to follow. Because what started with Luther wasn't just the Lutheran church or the Protestant Reformation. Luther blew open the dam of knowledge by the stand that he took. And this is what he said, quote, unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the Pope or in councils alone, since it is well known they had often erred and contradicted themselves. I am bound by the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. May God help me. Amen. Luther said, no, I will not, and was condemned. And had it not been for the sake of Prince Frederick III, Luther possibly would have had his end. But he was spirited away to another place that we would take you if we were in Germany to Wartburg Castle, and I've been in the room where Luther completed the translation of the Bible into German that was printed and printed and printed and distributed everywhere. And it went everywhere. There was a problem with that, you see. <laughs> it wasn't... It wasn't just that you needed to make sure that the Bible was printed. You had another problem. Same thing that happened in England as well with the translation of the Bible into English. What was the problem? The people couldn't read. So if you're going to challenge the authority of what the king, the monarchical episcopate is saying, if you can't read it, you're still relying on somebody else to tell you what, to, what it says. You're no further along. So what, ne what necessitated was schooling and learning and learning the language and learning what these scratches on a piece of paper mean or printed mean to what you say and to what then you have as terms of the signifier of that is that comes into your mind when you see the word. So what happened out of this, folks, 500 years ago 
is that all of a sudden you had an explosion of information being distributed, but then also of education. The genie was out of the bottle. And this is so much bigger than anything that you can imagine. We think of the Protestant Reformation as if it kind of happened like it does now. Well, we have our Reformation, and well, now we have the right books that we need to read and so forth. You couldn't even read. So you had to learn to read. There had to be innovation. But I'll tell you what happened is that the light of objective truth began to shine. No longer did men and women remain enslaved to being told what to believe and what to do and how to conduct themselves from magisterial authorities. They had the truth themselves and now had the ability to hold those who ruled over them responsible to an agreed standard. There's nothing new under the sun, folks. This isn't just a question of this happening in the church. Remember what I said at the very beginning of our talk. Tyrants don't really change in the way that they do things, whether they are ecclesial or governmental. It doesn't matter really what faith you want to put them in. I mean, I know that we think in terms of our Christian faith, but it's the way that this has existed since the beginning of time. Tyrants will tyrant. <laughs> but they now have the ability to hold those who ruled over them responsible to an agreed standard. And then, when the people at the bottom were able to put pressure on the people at the top, then the explosion of knowledge began. For the light of knowledge was beginning to shine. The desire to know how to read become preeminent because every man, every woman, every child could read for themselves, could understand for themselves what standard they were told to live by. And as the ability to read, to write, to communicate was necessitated, necessitated throughout what we would understand as Western civilization, well, then what happened? Well, the great leaps of knowledge were all of a sudden becoming commonplace. You talk about what happened between the time of the Reformation, how it happened in Germany, how it happened in Switzerland under Calvin, under Luther, under Zwingli, then the French Huguenots, then as well what happened in England after King Henry VIII. Not a perfect man, believe me, <laughs> but something wonderful happened there. Well, the other thing that happens is it has consequences. So in the years to come, the sciences, when we say science, remember what science is, it means the knowledges. The knowledges that had passed the test of falsification, the scientific method, the knowledge method. So when someone says, I am the science, what are you talking about? <laughs> You're saying, I am the knowledge? Well, can we falsify that? Can we put that through testing? because that's how knowledge is actually derived, true knowledge. Well, back then, because of all these things happening, the age of reason had its genesis. And it started from the Reformation. The common man pulled from the centuries of ignorance, found himself in the path to creating a new society with equality. All of a sudden, they were equal to those that were saying that they had to do things and think a certain way and be a certain way over them. And all of a sudden, there was equality. It's like, well, yeah, King, thank you very much, but that doesn't correspond to truth. Equality, liberty, common sense, and volitional responsibility became important. You couldn't just blame it on something else. Whether you were in a tribe, let's say, in Papua New Guinea or Africa, or if you were in a tribe in Ireland, you couldn't just blame it on the spirits or demons anymore. You'd say, well, there's a reason why this happened. So that kind of started to give strength in many ways, I believe, to what would be known as the movement of the English Reformation, the strengthening of the Puritans, and as well as far as the Reformed faith, because they would say, well, God ordained this, and I'm not going to blame it on anything else. So whether in an ecclesial sense or in the realm of scientific progress, the light of objective truth was beginning to burn bright. 
Now, through years of revolution, through many hardships and strife, the light continued to find its way through the cracks and crevices of ideological darkness. Because think about it, even though you've blown up an ecclesial authority over here and said, no, we're going to follow truth, what instantly happens is what? As soon as this ends, this institution, and you say, no, we're done with that, you then have new institutions that start, right? Like, unfortunately, one of the things that we do when we take people to Bartberg Castle, where Luther was, where he composed the, and, and translated the, the, the New Testament to German, is we take you over to the well, where basically the Lutheran authorities there in Bartberg condemn Fritz Erb to die in the well in Wartburg because he wouldn't baptize his children because he's reading the scriptures and he says, you know, I don't see here where I'm supposed to baptize my little kids. They're supposed to make a profession in faith first. I go, oh, no, no, you'd better baptize them. But I, I don't, that's not what the scripture says. So the Protestant authorities condemned him to die in the well. What happens? You need to be able to question the authority. Some didn't care for this kind of progress through the years. Some believed that, the near, that nearly everything was brought to us from centuries past. And how things were becoming where men were beginning to believe in truth and objective truth and away from necessarily mythological things. You think about what Luther and the reformers had to go through. I mean, in the Roman Catholic Church within each and every altar and so forth, they say, well... This church has a finger bone of St. Stephen. And in this monstrance here above the altar and so forth, we have breast milk from the Virgin Mary herself and so forth. You know, you had to, you had to get past all of this nonsense and you had to get back down to what you believe was truth about what the faith was, what the original message was of the Gospels, what the original message was of the Apostles. Let's just cut through all the nonsense here and talk about really what was happening. So you had people that were saying, well, understand really what you're building, though, when you say that you are modern in some sense, where you're following objective truth. Well, really what you already have that's set up is a social construct. And I think by providence, I don't know, if God, if God has a sense of humor, whatever the case may be, but this is amazing. Who would you say, especially after listening to both myself and Dr. Lindsay yesterday, would you say was the beginning of the horrific pattern of thought and ideolo ideologies that we'd be suffering through today? Before Marx, before Hegel was who? Rousseau. And I've been leading tours in Geneva for years. And sometimes, especially it's reform groups that want to go to Geneva, of course. You know, they want to go to Saint-Pierre. They want to ask John Calvin into their heart. <laughs> and they, they, want, they want to go to Saint-Pierre, which is now controlled by some, you know, I mean, wacky theological construct at this point that, you know, they have animal blessing masses and the Muslim mom comes in on Saturday and gives some message and so forth. But in the shadow of Saint-Pierre, where Calvin preached, literally in the shadow, like just down, Saint Pierre's on top of a hill, and all the streets lie down from there, just a few blocks this way down here, right before you get to that really nice hotel, I forget the name of it. That's where Rousseau was born. Literally in Geneva, Switzerland. And this is what Rousseau stated. This is his famous quote. Quote, Man is born free, but everywhere is in chains. And the followers of Rousseau and his concept of a social contract believed that Rousseau was so right that they needed to spark a revolution. Okay, so now we find ourselves 200 years past the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Rousseau is saying, all this advancement, all this modernity, all of this pursuit of objective truth and knowledge and so forth, well, this isn't good for humanity. And 
And into the age where man is progressing, when men are truly beginning to taste freedom and individual liberty. So just a few years before, decade or so before, you had the start of the American Revolution. And in the American, in the American Revolution, it's every man is sovereign. You have a system of government that is set up to say, well, we need to project we need to protect what is objective truth. We need to protect individual freedoms apart from the government and the state itself. Wow, that is dangerous because what that does is it decentralizes power. Who ends up having the power then? The people. And what else has the power? The truth. That's a problem. So now we find ourselves in 18th century France, at the dawn of what would be understood as the French Revolution. And this is where power-hungry elitist men who believed that the road to virtue was not through persuasion and discourse, but through terror. And a provincial lawyer from Ares and a tremendous admirer of Rousseau, Robespierre, that's where he began. And Rose Pierre, the man who was the founding father of state terror and the idol, the model of so many men that would come to follow in years after him, men like Marx and Stalin and Mao, and of course the Jacobins that were with him at the time. The first in the line of supposedly modest men with an access to higher truth. So what they did is they took themselves as the ones that had access to truth and said, we are the ones. We're going, to set, we're going to set up a new cognitive, I don't know, you'd call it a truth tunnel, <laughs> that we need to follow as opposed to this one that is starting up over here that's out of control, that the people are all in control. It seems like the king is letting this go on. But these men, the Jacobins, Robespierre. These were men like Rousseau who loved humanity so much that they felt entitled to exterminate the human beings that stood in its way. It was the birth of a system of loathsome paranoia which was responsible for the butchering of tens of thousands of human beings. The French Revolution. The greatest paradigm shifting event since the fall of the Roman Empire. And the revolutionaries had challenged the might and arrogance of the French court in Versailles. They executed their king, imprisoned their queen, and created a republic whose watchwords were, now think about this for a second, after what they did and the carnage that they brought. Their watchwords were liberty, equality, and the rights of man. But the revolutionaries also dreamed of a new type of society, one where human nature may be born again. Awakened, let's say. Where men and women freed from religious and social customs from the past could achieve moral perfection. And somehow, through this elitist group, it became reasonable that the idea that it's okay that tens and thousands of people with wrong ideas that they disagreed with should be slaughtered. As long as this new bourgeoisie idea of individual rights was overthrown. That's the way they looked at it. This whole idea of individual rights as if you're sovereign over what you can do. Well, that needs to be overthrown quickly. You better silence that right away. Because you see, this was for their good. This was for the common good. It was for your good. It was for your safety. It was for your safety to use violence to perfect humanity. Done by the elite class, the guardians, the Jacobins. Those that will tell you how you should be living your lives. It was Rousseau who said this, power is a form of moral schooling. Obedience. 
obedience school. And this deadly power in France was most often displayed through the use of the guillotine. And in their eyes, the use of terror is nothing but prompt, inflexible, severe justice. Kind of a social justice, if you will. And to make the revolution permanent, to make the revolution stick, everything old, the old ways of doing things, the old ways of thinking, the old ways that we look at one another as human beings, the old hierarchies that we had, everything old had to go. You needed, in essence, a cultural revolution. It was time for the new. You see, though, this was for your safety. So if everything is old, that was old, is out. And in your new revolution, you want to make sure that you start with the things that normalize their lives. You see, because the th things might be different for everyone on the other side of the revolution, because, you know, we're all in this together. So what you do is you start declaring the first day that the revolution had taken control the first day that the Jacobins had taken control. You start by declaring that first day and year of the revolution as year one. In other words, it's the first year of the new advent of mankind. That everything old is gone now. Paul Pot would mirror this, by the way, Paul Pot basically was educated from many of the folks that admired Rousseau. He would call in his revolution in Cambodia, the Khmer Revolution, he would call it year zero. The idea behind year one or year zero was that all culture and traditions within a society must be completely destroyed, dismantled, disrupted, deconstructed or discarded and a new revolutionary culture must replace it starting from scratch. All of the history of a nation or people before year one would be deemed irrelevant because it really needed to be purged and replaced from the ground up for it to succeed. Year one or the new beginning after the great revolution, year one, year zero, It was the French Great Reset. In the Great Reset of French civilization, no longer would you refer to someone as Madame or Monsieur. Now, everyone had to be looked at as citizen. So you erased all of the sexes, all the genders. You made sure that that would be a penalty if you didn't use the right pronouns. There's nothing new under the sun. And the church had to be brought in line with the revolution as well as the civil constitution of the clergy. So this constitution of the clergy, the civil constitution of the clergy was passed by a national assembly in 1790. And it attempted to reorganize and regulate the Catholic church and as well the Huguenot church in France, bringing them into line with the new revolutionary national values. You see, the church had to be along with the revolution because we still need to have a church state. They made the clergy paid employees of the government and required all members of the clergy to swear an oath of loyalty to the revolution. This was the reign of terror. If you resisted, well then, off with your head. And the primary force that was in control of the reign of terror that prohibited medium and large gatherings of people, by the way, because, you know, if you had more than 20 people together, it could be the start of a mob or a counter-revolution. So 
They had to be socially distanced. No crowds, of course. This was for your safety. And the organization within the French Revolution that was used to enforce the will of the now constitutional French Republic was the Committee of Public Safety. See, because in the absence of your individual rights, the main goal of the, operational, of, of the goal was operational success. See, you're kind of looking back at the same things we were talking about yesterday with hermeticism, hermeticism and alchemy. The goal of the revolution was not truth, an objective truth, and making sure that truth was the standard of, of everything. No, the goal was operational success because we must follow what Rousseau had laid out for us before. But no longer was law, basically that you had abolished along with the king, important me was, that was no longer an important measure for civil society. It was safety. Much like how today you have law enforcement being replaced by safety officers. You have basically law in terms of what guards your rights and gives you liberties replaced by public health. Public health isn't just about the, the magical mystery illnesses. Public health is also about what's the other thing that public health is saying is a public health crisis right now. Racism is a public health crisis. What else is a public health crisis? Guns. The ownership of guns is a public health crisis. You know what else is a public health crisis? And you can look this up. Disinformation and misinformation. You know what else is a public health crisis? The police. So this idea of safety is here to try to overthrow what you would understand are the paradigms that actually protect your liberties, that protect your ability to navigate your way with some degree of volitional ability in the world. It doesn't matter who you are in America. It doesn't matter what you believe. But you do believe that this idea of tolerance, and as well staying within the laws, that the laws that we have are meant to not restrict you, but provide that you do have liberty, and that there's nothing that you're going to do that's going to constrict the liberties of somebody else. So when people ask me, Mike, how can you start aligning with all these other people to, to fight this thing on social justice? And it's like, well, you got to understand, if somebody doesn't have the ability to freely believe, freely believe what they want to believe, that's an assault against your ability to believe against what you want to believe. Do you not see this? So, in the end, the French Revolution, though, didn't end up being so safe for Rose Pierre and the Jacobins. It didn't work out that way. Because tyrants are going to tyrant, and eventually tyranny ends up becoming something that is centralized, and they end up becoming the victim of their own tyranny. The French Revolution was basically overturned. And then decade after decade, though, this is what's happened. Men have fought to reinstall the revolutionary aspects of what was accomplished by the Jacobins and Robespierre, insisting that it just wasn't done right. This time, when we do it, when we do our revolution, this time when we do communism, it will be different. We'll do it right this time. And to some extent, yes, you have basically what is a gain of function of ideology. So you start with the horrible, terrible ideas of, 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 of Rousseau, and you go to the horrible, ter terrible ideas of, of Kant and Hegel, and you go to the terrible and horrible ideas of Marx, and you go to the terrible and horrible ideas of the Fabians, of George Bernard Shaw. Sorry to burst your bubble about that, by the way. George Bernard Shaw was one of the most evil men that ever lived. You go to, as well, Antonio Gramsci, then you go to the men of the Frankfurt School, and then you go to the men became the postmodernists, the neo-Marxists as well, and then you advance that into then the post-Marcusean age of identity politics. And each step along the way is still going back to what Rousseau had envisioned. 
As, as James so well said yesterday, it really goes back even further than that. But each time they would say that it would be different this time. So revolution after revolution after revolution, tens of millions of people being slaughtered for this pursuit. Well, they created a pattern, though, now in modern days that they believe to be efficient in overturning a civilization. A plan of how to take a nation from where it was and bring it to where you want it to be. It is a long march, and we will go through some of that tomorrow. But yes, there must be first the operational preparation of the environment. And by that, what I mean is this, is that when you are preparing to overthrow a civilization, when you're trying to take what was hegemonic, or let's say the beliefs of that civil civilization, those things that hold them together, people that have different beliefs, but there's a kind of a cultural standard that we can say, we all believe in this. These are our, our ideals. Well, you want to be able to deconstruct those. And so you start for years and years and years. A lot of people just became very aware of, let's say, critical race theory when they started to hear about it in 2020 or 2021 or 2022. That was going on for decades. That was being developed. But what was happening is it wasn't so much coming from the, in, from the outside, it was coming through the inside. It was coming from within education, it was coming within the churches, it was coming within the government, it was coming within law and legislation and so forth, but you just didn't see it. It was as well was starting to get transmitted through what we would call our arts and entertainment. So what you had was the beginning of a revolution, and this is what it kind of looks like. You know, what does this look like in our moment in history? And this is what it really boils down to, because you might be wondering to yourself, you know, it's like, well, we're not going through the French Revolution, Mike. So it's pretty close. It's not a whole lot different. Once again, I would say probably there's a lot of commonalities between what not only happened within communist revolutions that you've actually heard about or read about it, maybe some of you have experienced. I know my abuelo and abuelo came from Cuba. Uh, my wife and her family came from China. Maybe some of you have parents or relatives that came from Eastern Bloc countries that escaped. So it's not as if it's something that is completely unknown. But believe me, along the way, they've tried to perfect the model. But here's basically the steps, and I don't know if you can see this too well. I'll try to read through it for you. First of all, step one, you want to form a shadow government using, let's say, humanitarian aid or a cause or virtue as the reason why you want to do this. So whatever was within a government, whatever was the standard, you want to set up something that is basically its mirror shadow. It looks somewhat like the same things, or maybe it's just there to criticize, or maybe through the process of, of entryism, you're creating all of a sudden a new ruling class that will eventually begin to push out the old. More of a gradualistic form of doing things. The next thing you really want to start to do is make sure that you control the airwaves. And I say the airwaves, that's an old term that would be used. We could say this through social media, through mediums of communication, through mass media, social media, etc. And then as well, think about it from this perspective, also through church. So on any given weekend, I'd imagine that uh, Pastor John and Pastor Kyle communicate to probably thousands of people right from here. So you want to control those things too. Not here, obviously. They've kind of done a very good job of fencing the table, if you will, right? But you want to make sure that you control those outlets, that medium of communication. Step three, you want to destabilize the state, destabilize the government, weaken the government, and build an anti-government feeling in the country. Maybe you exploit an economic crisis. By the way, I first shared this about six years ago. I haven't changed anything on this. <laughs> you take advantage of an existing crisis. You never want to let a crisis go to right waste, right? You want to create pressure from the top and the bottom. You allow, you, this will allow you to, to weaken the government and build anti-government public sentiment. Step four, you sow unrest. Now, when you hear the word sow unrest, what do they mean by that? 
Some of you might have been around in the 90s and so forth and grew up as children of the 90s. There was a kind of an alternative rock song that the lyrics were, you got to keep them separated. You create that Hobbesian battleground that Jordan Peterson speaks of a lot, you know, where you basically have competing, competing identity groups against one another, blaming each other for their ills and so forth. And everybody's a victim, right? So if everybody's a victim, everybody is the victim of something or someone. Step five, you provoke an election crisis. Again, I started showing this six years ago. Provoke an election crisis. You wait for an election, and during the election, you end up crying about voter fraud, or you create that kind of feeling, which is what happened in 2016. 2016 and 2017, you couldn't go anywhere about finding that it was the Russians that actually took control of our election. Right? Step six, you take power, stage massive demonstrations, civil disobedience, sit-ins, general strikes, and you encourage activism. You then promote voter fraud and reflexively push the general population into action through the leveraging of fertile fallacies. Remember what we talked about fertile fallacies were? Lies that have legs. Incitement and violence are conducted at this stage. So you incite violence. Just recently, Secretary Mayorkas of the Department of Homeland Security announced, and this was carried everywhere, that there's gonna be a lot of mass casualty events in the United States of, of unrest. Like, oh, okay, that's kind of prescient. Why do you think that? <laughs> We're just gonna have all sorts of Reichstag moments all over the United States. Step seven, make sure that you outlast your opponent. That no matter what, no matter what they do, no matter what sort of things that they do to try to counter you, you outlast them. You do not budge an inch. If your son has an awful, terrible laptop that is discovered and so forth, just start him on his painting career. Don't let the FBI worry about that. If you have all sorts of problems and everybody can start to see that your whole supply chain crisis that you're, is really something that you're doing, it's strategic, if you're trying to destroy the economy, just keep on going. Kind of ignore it, just say another lie. You know, if you want to start to say, well, people are freaking out because gas is now $6.50 per gallon or whatever the case is, you just say, well, it's Putin's fault. And you keep on moving. Okay? Now, this model was also, if you remember who Van Jones is, he's been doing a lot of political commentary recently on CNN and MSNBC. He was at a time the Green, Jones, the, the green Jobs uh, Czar at the White House under Barack Obama. And this is what he said. He's a brilliant guy, by the way. Guy is a genius. He said, our governing move is three things, top down, bottom up, and inside out. We need to work on the middle and the bottom. Government will handle the top down, but it's also bottom up and inside out. So now you're challenged as you leave here. Your challenge is to take care of the bottom part and that inside out part, the heart part. What's he talking about? Well, first of all, it's this, top down. You need to basically get your desired officials, no matter what, into office. No matter how you get them there, you get your people at the top down. That's not just top down when we talk about the presidency, talking about senatorial runs, we're talking about House of Representatives, we're talking about judicial appointments. And if necessary, if you're not getting the kind of decisions that you want, let's say within the Supreme Court, what you make sure that you do then is you stack the court. You say, how many Supreme Court justices do we have right now? Why don't we have 25? Let's go ahead and appoint them all. So that's what you do. You know, this is usually an impact at scale. And then all of a sudden it becomes rather involuntary because as soon as you have the power from the top down, you never want to relinquish it, ever. You dig your heels in. Everybody else is a conspiracy theorist. As a matter of fact, everybody else is conspiring against you, trying to get you out, okay? So what you have to do is maintain power, even if that means looking at moms and dads going to public school commission meetings in the middle of the week complaining about CRT, and you wanna sick the FBI on them and you want them to start to be investigated, and you want to break down their, their doors and take their cell phones and harass them and bring charges against them and the whole bit. That's what you want to do. 
You've got to maintain your power. But you can't just maintain your power at the very, very top. You have to maintain your power at the top everywhere that you can. So when I hear that the district attorney in, in San Francisco is now out, but it's London Breed, the progressive mayor of San Francisco, that'll be appointing somebody else to take their place until a, another election can be held. Believe me, they're gonna take their, their good long time. And the DA that you just kicked out, who might be coming in back in, might even be worse. Like, don't, even, don't you understand that they're thinking 20 steps ahead of you? Because what you do in your life, you think, I play by the rules. I do what's necessary, I, I get my education, I work hard, I receive money, I get my home, I take care of my car, I have retirement, take care of my kids, and so forth, and that's how I live my life. And I live life happy. I have part of some communities, affinity communities, and so forth, and that's where I derive my happiness in life. And I live a good life. No, 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 they don't think that way. <laughs> See, when you're doing that, they're thinking, how can we seize control? What means can we do this? How can we ensure that we are the ones that are controlling and taking control of everything? How can we do that? And how can we take that control, not just from a political standpoint, but from a cultural standpoint, and to destroy the lives of people in the future to where your family is the state and the state is your family? Now, individual people might think, no, you know, I'm sorry, but that's not real. I can't think that paranoid, and so we're just going to let it happen to you then. So first you have the top down. Then you have the bottom up, which is basically social change created by an encouraged crisis opportunity or mass reflexive action. So you create your reflexive events that convert the uninvolved to the involved. So some of those people that aren't necessarily on the right, but those people that aren't necessarily involved, they're living their lives too. They're people that are progressive or liberal in the way that they, outlook, they have an outlook on things, but you know, they enjoy <laughs> staying home on the weekend and getting some ice cream and a hot cup of tea and watching a binge watching some series that was on HBO a few years ago. Or maybe, maybe they enjoy just going out and doing things with some friends and and so forth, but they have a different outlook on life, but they just want to live their life, be happy, and be left alone. Well, you've got to get them involved in things. You've got to let them know there is a crisis, and we need you to be enlisted in this. Now, some people might come back and say, well, Mike, that's you. It's like, no, that wasn't me a few years ago. It wasn't until I saw that this was obviously what they were doing. So the key features of this movement would be basically voluntary, but often need-driven by narratives driven by necessary fertile fallacies. So what you do is you start to create these movements and you as well generate this kind of support to maybe go out along with the Marxist revolution that is destroying all the cities of America and you start to have them jump in as well because the hierarchy must be overthrown. But they're never gonna tell you what's gonna happen three steps down the road. Because what you're bringing in is not what you think you're bringing in. You think you're bringing in freedom and liberty, but what you're actually bringing in is tyranny. And all of a sudden, I, I saw that yesterday Amy Coney, Coney Barrett's home was now being hassled and so forth. So all the conservative justices now are going to have people outside of them, and no one's going to do anything about it. Which is illegal, of course. But one of the features of repressive tolerance is you cannot allow them to continue to do what they're doing. So your, your goal is not really liberty, it's not really freedom. Your goal is to make sure that everybody is on this revolutionary path. So that's bottom up. So you think of groups like March for Our Lives. Remember when it was David Hogue, right? That strange guy that doesn't even know how to tweet or whatever he's doing. But you know, the whole gun rights thing that is a wonderful actor, I think. Or, and then you have masses, tens of thousands of people showing for the protests, Black Lives Matter, another big movement that they've had and so forth. You have these mass action protests that must be allowed and are covered by every single you know, media source that you can have. But if you have something that's conservative, that's not allowed to continue. And then you have it from the inside out. And so that's the binding parts of the culture that keep everything stuck together. 
So think top down, bottom up, and then you have the inside. The inside is the glue, okay? That's what keeps us together. Things like national pastimes, like baseball, basketball, and football, which of course, they don't have anything to do with social justice or progressive politics, right? You have it with Hollywood films and entertainment. That has nothing to do with progressive politics, right? You have that as well now with faith. So you have the same things that you're doing in all these other affinity groups. You have the same thing actually happening through the Christian church. That's what you do. And as well, you want to make sure that you completely unstick the glue of patriotism where we go, well, look, we're all Americans. We're in this together. Because the idea is, as Dr. Lindsay spoke about yesterday, is to start forwarding the concept of a global citizen. So what you want to do is to really break apart the, the key parts of spiritual and cultural underpinnings that keep us together. Those things that we can all joke about, regardless of our beliefs and so forth that we have spiritually, at the water cooler, at work. Can't have that anymore. We've all be, got to be at odds with one another. So it's top down, bottom up, and inside out. That's how you overthrow a government. Now I want you to think for a moment what's happening within faith. The same strategy utilized in, pol in political and social theater is used to reflexively manip manipulate and mold faith communities through fertile fallacies. So in the past, we would talk about, <laughs> and this is what Open Societies has done through some of their groups, like one of them is that you can, you can refer to quite easily as Sojourners. Has an evangelical ministry organization compromised? Is your pastor a rented evangelical? Well, first, what you could know is, by the way, this again was from six years ago. Does he or she have increased appearances with liberal and progressive leaders? Was there an overwhelming new focus on social justice and critical race theory with your leaders? You know, people, I had to explain to them what critical race theory was back then. Now everybody knows. Is there continuous knee-jerk immediate criticism of the current executive administration of the United States? That was the Trump administration back then. An encouragement to constituents to vote differently than evangelicals would normally vote. What you would hear consistently out of the mouths of Beth Moore, Russell Moore, as well at Willie, at Willie Rice's church in Clearwater, Florida. An intense focus on allowing illegal immigration and opposing sovereign borders. Support of climate change and global warming initiatives. So was that something that you would say that you saw? Also a focus on referring to sovereign states as opposed to sovereign nations more of a state-federal kind of situation for a supranational state. Well, once again, with faith, you would want to do what? If you have a denomination or a count, uh, let's say a convention of churches, or you have a parachurch organization, you want to get your desired person elected as the head of your denomination. Get your men in at the head of the seminaries. Those that are going to be pushing these revolutionary ideas. It's the same play. It's no different. You do the same thing if you were taking over the Boy Scouts. You do the exact same thing if you're taking over Ravelry, a knitting group that's worldwide. You do the same thing. Bottom up. Create your reflexive events that convert the uninvolved to the involved. The Church Me Too movement, led by Ed Stetzer. MLK 50 that they had that back in 2018. That was the moment that a lot of people started to wake up about what was actually going on. This is where I had my giant, I told you so moments. The Gospel Coalition, and think about what the Gospel Coalition is. What do you have in Roman Catholicism? You have an authority at the very top. You have the Pope, right? And then you have the magisterium underneath them. And basically you have what would be understood as the doctrine of the church. And they have authority over all the other churches, all the other parishes. You don't have that in Protestant Christianity. You have thousands of different denominations. So what you want to do is you want to create a coalition of churches and all sorts of different leaders that all agree on the same thing. And they all agree that social justice needs to be our main focus. 
They all agree that we're too conservative in the way that we do things. They understand as well that, look, the way that we approach things epistemologically is too white in the way that we do things. So they start down this road of creating a revolution within the organization that you're a part of. That's why you have the Gospel Coalition. What you do is you take it down the dialectical road that James had talked about yesterday. So basically you have the thesis, the antithesis, and then the synthesis. So you'll have an article written by someone in the Gospel Coalition that said, you know, we must repent of our white gospel. Then you'll have another article that says, no, I think so-and-so has gone a little bit too far. That's not the right way to look. Then they'll finally have a synthesis where maybe they can participate in an article together. Maybe they can have a discussion in a panel where they find a synthesis of the way that we can agree still as brothers. So that whole thing basically has to be done away with, <laughs> called for what it is. It's a dialectical piece that's being used to move the church left. That's what it is. And why is it that all of a sudden, the biggest enemy of the Southern Baptist Convention swampish leadership and the, the, the Gospel Coalition, why all of a sudden is it James Lindsay? <laughs> James Lindsay. You know, it, it's like, well, because he's actually talking about the things that they're doing. That was what was so deadly, is we started attacking this problem from the outside. We weren't just talking about them, we're talking about everybody. And he's just calling it the way he is, the way it is. So, oh, I know what you're doing right now. What you're doing is thus and thus. Oh, you know, how dare an atheist say these things? Well, who are you getting your whole plan from? When I go to the Gospel Coalition website, I can go over to the 10-part teaching series, maybe it's eight-part teaching series, on how to view the Bible through the French postmodernists Jacques Derrida and Michel Foucault, these two pedophile French postmodernist atheists whose specialty was deconstruction and power relationships. You can get that on the Gospel Coalition website. We're not being conspiracy theorists, folks. We're just calling it like it is. This is what's happening. And thankfully, James has been used more, I think, everywhere, in everything, to try to just bring the truth about what's happening and describe it plainly. If you want to know, you listen to James. Okay, here's the problem. People think, well, if you want to know, it needs to come through a Christian mouth. How did all of this come in in the first place into the church? Through men that were considered leaders within the church. It was an insurrection. It was the men that were leading institutions that say, we're here and we, are, we can be trusted for truth. Of course, what does truth mean? We're not going to talk about that. We can be trusted for truth. You know, we have to protect our democracy. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you have these that are saying, no, don't you dare stop the revolution that we started right now. That's what's happening. So you have that. Then as well what you have is you need to create an inside-out change, which would be through epistemology, hermeneutics, pedagogy, culture of the church. So what you do with epistemology is opposed to you saying, look, I'm going to take a, a, a class on exegesis. I'm going to learn the Greek. I'm going to learn the Hebrew. I'm going to understand how to to extricate, extricate the, the truth from the scriptures and to be able to teach that properly and so forth. So I understand the original languages. I understand that I'm carrying the truth. I have a confessional standard and so forth. What you want to do is say, well, you need to blow all that up. We believe that the, that the word of God is inerrant, but the ways of knowing things and the ways of learning needs to be, what did Jarvis, Wall, uh, what did Jarvis Williams say yesterday? It needs to be decolonized. Okay? Same thing with your hermeneutics. You bring standpoint hermeneutics. From what standpoint do you actually interpret the Word of God? Do you interpret it from a Latino perspective? Do you, turn it, do you interpret it from a feminine perspective? Do you interpret it from a, um, you know, a, a, uh, an albino Eskimo perspective? Then as well through pedagogy, which would be teaching, the way in which you teach, you start to bring in new methodologies. And, and as well, Dr. Lindsay will be talking about that and understanding Paula Ferreri. And then the culture of the church itself needs to complete, completely be changed. So you need to create a cultural revolution within the church. 
That's what you do. You do the same thing that you're doing nationally in a macro level, in a micro level, but if you're here, and this is not the case with you being in an affinity group, you do the same thing in every single organization that you want to disrupt and dismantle. You do, you do this at a corporate level within corporations. You, you do this within every single group that you can think of. You, within the Dungeons and Dragons groups, they were doing this. You do this at another cultural, let, let, let's think, what else would you consider in America to be a cultural institution that everybody just knows what it stands for and we love it? Think. Maybe something in Orlando, Florida, and Anaheim, California. <laughs> that all of a sudden, has been, everybody's really realizing, man, it's going completely off the rails. It's like, it's been going off the rails for years, guys. Remember when uh, um, that company bought Star Wars, the franchise? Whew. What do you think episodes 7, 8, and 9 are? They're deconstructing episodes 4, 5, and 6. It was all about social justice. So you have Star Wars and you have social justice Star Wars. You have the racist, uh, patriarchal Star Wars. And then you have the kinder, gentle Star Wars, you know? It's really about overturning the hierarchy. That's what this is all about. Everything in your culture right now is about the same thing. And once you start to understand what they're doing to you and how they're trying to manipulate you, you'll start to get sick. You'll start to see it everywhere, like, oh, that's what they're doing. Yeah, I know what they're doing. They're going to top down, but I'm just like, there we go. <laughs> you know, here they go. They're going to try to change the language, you know. And as James was saying, the we're just, you know, and all of a sudden you start to hear that all the time. Once you understand what the Mott and Bailey is, you're like, oh, they're doing this again. You know, and the thing that is the biggest danger right now is not necessarily the ones that were horrible in bringing in the social justice nonsense in five years ago. The biggest danger, which is the same thing that you can say if you were a conservative Republican right now, and you're trying to win your, win your primaries, and you're trying to win back your seats in Congress, the biggest problem are rhinos. Yep. Yes. The biggest problem are Republicans that are purple and they're not red. Right. And when it comes down to doing whatever is necessary, they're going to vote blue yes. every single time. Yes. So that's the biggest problem that you have. In other words, you have these soft conservatives the, and so it's the same problem in the church. Right now, the biggest problem that I see happening right now is not necessarily those that are fringe, you know, postmodern social justice, critical race theory guys. It's those that are the soft anti-CRT groups. Well, we certainly stand against critical race theory, and we stand against social justice, but we don't want to name the names of our brothers and, you know, really corrupt our fellowship and bring disunity to the body of Christ. And you always have to say it with a very hushed tone, of course, <laughs> because you can't proclaim everything in Christianity. You can't say it with strength anymore, right? Because if you say it with strength, as if you're talking to the person in the back of the room, that means you're in the flesh. It's like, oh, okay. No, I've been told that before. I'm like, huh. You know, I've been to Germany and Switzerland and I've been to Israel and been to England and Scotland where the reformers were too. You know, the thing is, when I was in Saint Pierre, I was in the Schloss Church where Luther was in the pulpit, you know, and there'd be like a thousand people there. And they couldn't talk like I am right now, where you can hear me. You know why? Because they didn't have microphones. <laughs> and so when you spoke in church back then, you had to project in such a way that someone could hear you in the back. Now that will move and motivate your preaching. It will change the way in which you deliver your message. It will change the way in which you speak. Because you want to make sure that someone hears your every word. But no, Mike, we just think you're a little bit, well, let's go back to, uh, let's take a look at the scriptures and start making our way through that. We don't want to really interrupt you or, you know, Make sure that, that in, in any way that, you know, somehow some passions might be created within you that might move you to action, to do something about what's happening around you. For you to be lit aflame. Not only to change the problems that we're talking about now, but if you're a Christian, to light you aflame. To proclaim the gospel in a dark, a dark culture. 
a dark nation that has no hope right now. We've changed the way that we've communicated. We decided that we'd start communicating like postmodernists. And we think that somehow, with that approach, that we will win. We need men with chess. That's what C.S. Lewis would say. You need men with chess that are willing to proclaim the truth. You, have men with, you need to have men with chess that are willing to disagree. That are not going to build straw men of their opponents and attack the straw men. They say, I disagree with you on this. Let's talk about why. We have to reclaim the way we disagree, the way that we proclaim, and the way that we do things to take back not only this culture, not only the civilization, to take back the church. We need to approach things again with masculine men, and yes, with feminine women. Women that are women and men that are men. And I would say that, that women that are women right now also are looking forward to having men that will actually act like men so that the women don't have to act like men to get something done. Men that will take control, men that will think about how they're going to succeed or how they're going to do something. And ladies, I would say to you that we men, we have to think about how we need to be those gallant men how we need to be those men that really are in their vision what we should be. Not just women, men that are acting like women, but men that act like men. And that doesn't mean uncharitable. That doesn't mean unkind. That means men that are willing to sacrifice. Men were willing to go to war in centuries past because of what they thought that they were protecting back home, the women that they loved, the children that they loved, or the civilization that they loved. Why do you think in England, especially in the Victorian area and before, you would have beautiful women on all of the buildings that they were carving in the 1800s? Why? Because if men didn't have a gal back home, they still knew what they loved and what they had as an ideal that they were going to protect. That's why they named their airplanes after women, their ships after women, because they knew what they loved and they valued in that sense. I'm talking that, that in a cultural level. That's something as well, biblically, that is based. So will we do that? Will we take that stand? Will men be who they are called to be? Will we be, will we be complementarian in the way that we actually do that within the church? Or will we be ineffective, soft men without chess? I, t I say it's time to take a stand. And I say it's time for us to do that. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we must win. Thank you very much. Yeah.